So it could be anything that's happening in, in the lining of the brain. It could be stretching, infiltration, mm -hmm. inflammation. Any, exactly. any, process, any of these processes can, can trigger off this primary pain problem, which is then transferred to the thalamic, well, it, thalamic it, centers. Exactly, and the, the, and, the, and the secondary headaches we'll, we'll talk about involve in some way that, and that's how that, 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 that process happens. The primary headaches seem to, um, the, the brain in the primary headache seems to perceive that these, this covering is being attacked or infiltrated or, or whatever, as you, as you suggested. And then the pain processing system, the processing of that pain involves the trigeminal nucleus, and then involves the thalamus, and then involves the cortex. Okay. We'll probably talk a little bit more about the migraine uh, pathophysiology a little bit later, but I think we'll move on from there now. And what I'm quite interested in is, is how we actually classify headache. To understand the world, uh, we need to describe it and classify it, and then we can move on to, to look for some prescriptive options. But in fact, headache wasn't classified until 1988, which is really quite late in modern medicine. I just wondered why, why we had to wait such a long time for headache to be classified. Yes, you're right. There, there was no rigorous classification until 88. There, historically, the, there was a what was called an ad hoc a classification, which wasn't uh, terribly friend, which was wasn't terribly uh, well constructed, shall we say, in term, particularly from a research point of view. I mean, meaning to say that it had a lot of vague, ifs, uh, vague terms in it. It was done in the 1960s by the NIH, the ad hoc committee. It took till 88. I think that there are several reasons for that. I mean, invariably in medicine, there are some politics, uh, individuals, country differences. I mean, it's a wonderful place that we live to be able to have our colleagues and, uh, and see, see those differences. The other thing is conditions come of age. I think that, it, that the classification of headache has evolved because, we start, because it began to be better described and better understood. Mm -hmm. And at the very time that that started to happen, the medicine development started so that the, there was an academic interest and then there was resource mm -hmm. to do it because mm -hmm. the um, sumatriptan mm -hmm. was discovered in 86. And so by 87, when the committee was getting started, the first sumatriptan's father, which never got past a, a number, AH number, actually was around in 87. And I think that the two things came together and you know, mm. very much of these things are of their time. Yeah. And there was a second revision again in 2004, which I believe you were involved in. Yes. And I've got here that... I'll take some guilt for that. <laughs> the, the Bible of Headache, this is the yes. International Classification of Headache Disorders, which in fact runs to about 135 pages. It's quite interesting. It's available on the web on the IHS website. But I just wanted to pick up on, on how detailed the classifications are in, in this document. Let's yes. just move to migraine, if we could. So to have migraine, and this is, this is formal migraine, and I'm sure we'll talk about how you can relax these criteria, you need at least five attacks. So presume if you have four attacks, you can't have migraine. It has to last between four and 72 hours. It has to have two of the following characteristics, one-sided, pulsating, moderate or severe, aggregated by um, routine physical activity. And you have to have at least one of nausea or vomiting, phonophobia or photophobia. Now, that, that is quite a specific uh, diagnostic criteria. I just wondered how easy it was for, for a panel to come up with criteria that specific for so many disorders. You know, was there a bit of politicking? Were there some difficulties? I'm interested in the sort of human side of how that uh, classification arose, really. And, and I guess it is a fluent, it's, it's always on the move. Things will, uh, will be redefined and they will be shifting all the time. Yes, yeah, so that's true. From 1988, when the first classification was done, until 2004, which is a spectacular long time to make the revision, there was very little shifting because the, uh, there, was a, there was a feeling in the field that we, ought, that we ought to try and leave it alone for a while, study it and see what the weaknesses were. I think that since 2004 there have been a couple of appendix revisions even because the, the methodologies have gotten clearer and our ability to um, perhaps un, uh, study, these th study them and get better criteria that, that's gotten, that, that's advanced itself. Um, how did the original agreements come to? I certainly wasn't on the 88 panel, but my mentor, Jim Lance, was. And I think that it, migraine is what it is. And when, when the committee got together and wrote down, started to write down what they thought was going on, uh, it was pretty, most people pretty quickly agreed what the core features of migraine were. Um, this uh, operational 
the way it's done operationally, that is you have to have one of these, one of these and one of these, has two advantages. One, it tells you straight away that there's almost nothing that's absolutely required. And that's helpful mm -hmm. in a way because it means it, it may, and you know in general practice, I mean, you, because you, you see um, you see diseases at an early stage. And you, you know where it's going, but you mm -hmm. don't, and you get the just gestalt of it, so mm -hmm. to speak. So that flexibility w was there from the start. Um, I think that because the committee, initial committee, had a, a very a lot of very experienced people, it was relatively easy to agree what the core features of uh, migraine were. The big argument that came out of that argument, well, this argument, disagreement, if you want, is where you draw the line with tension type headache, mm. and that. Um, continued in the 2004 classification such that there's an appendix tension type headache criteria because actually the committee never agreed um, on the tension type headache classification in the second edition uh, because it, there's actually quite diametrically opposed views. It's, mm. it's a very, mm. and, and if, you, you know, if your colleagues are sitting there thinking this is difficult, we agree, a hundred percent. I think it's important to point out this is really for research uh, uh, process. I mean, for the clinical perspective, you relax these rules. I mean, you would, you would. I know you personally would make a diagnosis of migraine well outside the, the diagnostic criteria in here. So, although this is very important, it's a very important first place to stop. It, it is very often relaxed, isn't it? Yeah, I think that's true. I mean, I think that you know, if you sit, you're sitting in your in your clinic that tall people and short people walk through and you don't stop them being human because of that. So you have to be flexible. On the other side of it, if you're um, doing any sort of uh, research, if you're developing medicines, if you're trying to understand the core features of a condition, I think you need to get a group that's pretty much more homogenous mm. and the, that criteria has that, has that, um, has that feature. The problem is in, in, in this business, if we relax the criteria such that they took in every migraineur, they'd be next to useless. Mm -hmm. um, and if we had them so tight that they were always right, they would be next to useless. So they do, to a certain extent, um, have a, they're, they're an element of compromise to them. I think the core theme, however, that migraine is, is a condition with features and that you don't have to have all the features, but you have to have some to be confident of it is important. Because from a primary care point of view, you're seeing a person and uh, you, you want to be, if you're going to take the history, do the examination and make the diagnosis and not want to take it any further, the f closer they are to these criteria, mm. you can then rely on the rest of the evidence. Mm. So for example, yeah. if they've got, um, I know you're interested in this question about an imaging, for example, mm. and the, if they meet the criteria, mm. they have a normal examination, mm. then we know that we don't need to be doing mm. imaging and we don't need to worry about that. And that, mm -hmm. that's an advantage. Yeah. Perhaps we could just look at the two big divisions. This classification starts off by dividing headache into primary and secondary. Could you just say a little bit about what primary and secondary headache is? Yes, primary headache, uh, I, very, I mean, it's very often easy to say what secondary headache is and primary headache, I guess. Um, secondary headache, we conceptualise as headache where that's caused by another disorder, by disorder, by another disorder. So, um, infection, um, inflammation, um, trauma, something that produces head pain. It's a secondary headache. Giant cell arteritis, temp temporal arteritis is a, is a good example. Subarachnoid hemorrhage is another good example. Brain tumor headache, meningitis. Primary headaches I conceptualise as headaches where the where the disorder is in the central nervous system. And the brain is the end organ, if you, if you want, um, the driver of the problem. And headache is part of the manifestation of, uh, of that disorder. The reason I'm using words like that, because uh, as you know, we now have the genes for familiar, some forms of familiar hemiplegic migraine. So you, you can have the protein. And so there is a structural difference, the mutation, and if you start, if you classify primary headache according to structural or not structural, it depends on how much of a microscope you want to have. So I think a primary headache is a disorder of the brain, where that's the end organ problem, and secondary headaches is uh, headaches that are caused by some other disorder, not of the end organ. Okay, well thank you Peter. I think that's a useful place perhaps just to pause, and in our next video we can perhaps look at some of the secondary headaches in a little bit more detail. Thank you. Thanks.